Well, hi there. Welcome to part three of this three-part lecture series on metabolism. And uh, we covered thus far, we did an overview of chemical reactions and enzymes. We talked about glycolysis and the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain. So now I just want to summarize up these, these processes and uh, then move on to anaerobic uh, respiration or uh, fermentation. So just looking at the three processes that we just discussed, glycolysis, Krebs cycle, and the ETC, or electron transport chain, um, I wanted to give you an idea where those processes take place within eukaryotic cells and prokaryotic cells. So glycolysis, both in eukaryotes and prokaryotes cytoplasm, Krebs cycle in eukaryotes, the matrix of the mitochondrion. So I put the picture of the mighty mitochondrion down below, and the matrix is that blue area. It looks like a really cool swimming pool, which is how I'd want my pool to look, of course. I could tell people it looks like the mitochondrial matrix pool, and it would be awesome. So that's where the Krebs cycle take, takes place, in this, uh, this aqueous environment within the inner membrane, which is called the Christi, of the mitochondrion. In prokaryotes, they don't have mitochondria, so Krebs takes place in the cytoplasm. The ETC, it takes place in eukaryotic cells in the mitochondrial inner membrane. So the inner membrane, like I said, is also called the Christi, and it goes back and forth, large amounts of surface area with all these convolutions and bends and folds in it. And so more surface area, more functional uh, area to make ATP and to generate energy for the cell. In prokaryotes, it, it occurs in the plasma membrane. This is not going to be as efficient because the plasma membrane does not have all these folds and bends and twists and turns in it like the inner membrane of the mitochondrion has. So they have less functional surface area, which means overall they're going to produce less ATP uh, as uh, when in comparison uh, in, in, if you compare it with the mitochondria. So here's a, another summary slide here, the equation. You have C6H12O6, which is glucose, add oxygen, 38 ADPs, adenosine diphosphate plus 38 phosphates. Uh, these would be the independent ones. That's going to yield the waste product, carbon dioxide, and water, and 38 ATPs. So this is the overall goal, and this equation is for prokaryotes. If this were eukaryotes, the number would be 36 instead. But like I said, the number there is variation with this number of how many ATPs are actually produced uh, from cell to cell and, and different uh, from organism to organism. So looking at the totals for each process, glycolysis, remember it produces four, but only two can be used by the cell because two are, are consumed in the beginning uh, stages, the prep stage of glycolysis. So we take four usable minus the two that are used, and so we have a net gain of two ATPs. In the Krebs cycle for every molecule of glucose, you get two ATPs. I want to specify that because every turn of the Krebs cycle, you get one but that's only for half a glucose. That's just for one pyruvate. Uh, two pyruvates equals one glucose molecule, so for every glucose you're going to get two ATPs. In the ETC, eukaryotic cells will produce approximately 32, 34 in prokaryotes. So you get a few more out of the prokaryotes than you do in the eukaryotes. And the goals for each process, the goal of glycolysis is to catabolize or split glucose break it down in a 10-step process into pyruvic acid, producing a little bit of ATP along the way, and also NADH. Krebs cycle, to obtain the electrons from pyruvic acid, which were originally electrons of glucose, and then transfer them into, uh, transfer them to, to the electron carriers so they become NADH and FADH2. Remember, NADH was NAD plus before it was reduced, and FADH2 was FAD before it was reduced. And remember, reduction means gaining electrons. So these electron carriers take the energetic electrons from pyruvic acid, hold on to them, and then the energy from those electrons is utilized to make ATP in the next uh, step, the electron transport chain. <clears throat> so those electrons provide that energy to, uh, if you remember in, in the last part near the end when I tried to summarize or explain the ETC, um, the energy from those electrons is used to 
uh, actively transport H plus ions from one side of a membrane to the other to create the proton motive force so that ATP can then um, ATP synthase the enzyme can then generate ATP from ADP. So that's the summary of it. This is the overview of it. Summaries are important slides, so my college students, please pay attention to this slide. Um, you'll need to know some information from it. So I just wanted, we're going to go back now. We, we completed aerobic respiration where the final electron acceptor was oxygen. Now we're going to look at anaerobic respiration where the final electron acceptor is not oxygen. This yields far less energy, far fewer ATPs are produced from anaerobic than from aerobic, but aerobic will produce ATPs. Um, I'm sorry, anaerobic will produce ATPs when oxygen levels are very low or virtually non-existent. So for example, uh, anaerobic, I want to try to make this practical, like if you were going to do an all-out sprint, uh, a grizzly bear was chasing you and you've got to move and you need to move immediately. Your cells are demanding tons of energy all at once, no time for oxygen to, to, to breathe in enough oxygen uh, for a, a long enough period of time to get to aerobic respiration. So anaerobic respiration, maybe a less threatening example would be um, you're, you're getting ready for the 100 meter dash and in order to run the 100 meter dash as an all out burst of energy, anaerobic respiration or fermentation is going to be the pathway that's utilized to get the ATP generated quickly enough. So fermentation, what, what is this? So here's some general facts about it. Um, releases energy from oxidation of organic molecules. So these organic molecules are giving up their electrons, and uh, so we call that oxidation. Energy will be released when those electrons uh, are, are removed from those organic compounds. It doesn't require oxygen, so that's a benefit. It's, it's, oxygen is not necessary for this process to occur. It does not use the Krebs cycle or the ETC. It, it produces only two ATPs, and that's through glycolysis. Specifically, fermentation itself, the, the, the biochemical processes of fermentation produce no ATPs, but glycolysis is part of it, so I guess you can say two ATPs are made. Um, what's an important benefit of it? Well, it provides glycolysis with a steady supply of NAD plus and NADP plus, um, which is another electron carrier that um, is found in, in some organisms. Uh, so the glycolysis can continue producing ATP. So when glycolysis runs out of NAD plus or NADP plus, it's done. I mean, it can't continue anymore. There, there's, no, there's nothing to accept the electrons from glucose. And so when that occurs, then the whole process shuts down. So what happens is, is NAD plus and NADP plus, they become reduced. They take electrons from glucose. Uh, and then they move on through the fermentation process, and then fermentation um, takes the electrons from NAD plus and NADP plus, actually it would be NADH and NADPH. They then become oxidized, give up their electrons, become NAD plus or NADP plus, and then they go back to glycolysis, and the cycle just keeps going around and around and around. Fermentation is used extensively in food and beverage production, so we count on bacteria to carry out the process of fermentation in order to, pr um, to produce our foods, like cheeses and, of course, alcoholic beverages and so forth. And the two types that you need to know, the two that I'm going to, to touch upon are alcohol fermentation and lactic acid. Now, there are other types of fermentation, but these two are by far the, more, the most common. So with alcohol fermentation, that ends up producing ethyl alcohol or ethanol plus carbon dioxide, CO2. They're, they're both waste products. Um, lactic acid fermentation, of course, produces lactic acid or lactate. So there's, this is a, a very inefficient process. Much of the original energy, about 90% of the energy of the glucose molecule, still remains in the bonds of the ethanol and the lactic acid. So 90% of the energy does not get extracted through the process of fermentation. That's why you only, you're only getting two ATPs. Um, aerobic respiration is much better, but it's not great. It's about... It varies, but it's around upper 30s, between 35 and 40 percent efficient. 60, 60 to 65 percent um, still remains locked up, un untapped energy. 
So that is about as efficient as, I guess, a, an automobile engine somewhere in, in that ballpark. Um, so there's still a good deal of energy, even with alcohol, I'm sorry, even with aerobic respiration, um, there's still a good deal of energy that just is not utilized by the cell. So uh, cells are certainly not 100% efficient. Lactic acid fermentation, we'll look at that one first. The bacteria that we use mainly for that are streptococcal species and lactobacilli species. Uh, producing yogurt from milk, getting sauerkraut from cabbage, pickles from cucumbers. And so through the process of lactic acid fermentation, these foods are converted due to the production of lactic acid into uh, yogurt, sauerkraut, or a pickle. Um, so these, uh, these foods are brought about by that. Um, and it's, it's just the addition of the acid. And uh, it, it then leads to preservation of these foods as well because of the, acidic, the acidity of these foods. And it prevents uh, or, or hinders, at least curtails, uh, bacterial contamination. Alcohol fermentation carries, you, you, it undergoes glycolysis, just like lactic acid fermentation does as well. So they both start with glycolysis. Pyruvic acid is converted to two molecules of acetaldehyde and two molecules of carbon dioxide. And that uh, acetaldehyde then is, is reduced, so it gains electrons and it forms ethanol. Carried out by some bacterial species and by yeast. And Saccharomyces cerevisiae is a species of yeast. It's a predominant one that is used to uh, that's used in the food industry to cause bread to rise. And there are a number of variants of of this particular species of yeast that are utilized, especially in the wine industry, as they have genetically modified these yeast. Um, they can actually alter the flavor and the alcohol content and percentage slightly and so apparently using these different variants of the saccharomyces yeast you get different i guess nuances to the flavor of wine i'm not sure i'm not a wine connoisseur i like wine but i wouldn't really know the difference between a hundred dollar bottle of wine and a fifteen dollar bottle of wine so anyway the co2 that's produced whenever it is this yeast is introduced into raw bread dough, that causes the dough to rise. And so you can see the air spaces in the slice of bread. Well, that was from the carbon dioxide that was produced uh, through the process of alcohol fermentation. Of course, ethanol is important for alcoholic beverages. Um, so um, the alcohol, by the way, whenever the bread is baked, it evaporates, and so then none of it remains within the bread. However, it does alter the flavor of it. It depends on how the bread is prepared and how long it's uh, how much time is given to it to, to allow it to rise and if you do uh, if you let it rise twice or three times that affects the texture and the flavor of the bread so looking at <clears throat> fermentation side by side lactic acid fermentation and alcohol fermentation you can see they both start with glycolysis so they go through the process of that and then you end up with pyruvic acid and then one of two pathways will occur it'll either follow through with lactic acid fermentation and you can see that the NADH that was produced by glycolysis uh, is oxidized into NAD+. The NAD+, then gets cycled back into, glu into glycolysis, and the process continues there on the left side with lactic acid fermentation. On the right-hand side, there's an intermediate step where the pyruvic acid becomes acetaldehyde, and then that undergoes more chemical reactions, and uh, ethanol is, is the final product. Uh, NADH, here again, is oxidized into NAD+, and then it goes back to glycolysis as well. And you can see in the process of pyruvic acid becoming acetaldehyde, a car uh, carbon dioxide is produced in, in that process. So that's, those would be the, the two waste products of alcohol fermentation, the carbon dioxide and ethanol. Whereas with lactic acid fermentation, it's just lactate that's produced. Now that lactate produces temporary soreness in our muscle fibers, for example. You may have felt that before if you've ever worked out, which I hope you have. Um, you can feel a little bit of the effects of that. Now that's mainly due to micro tears and micro trauma in muscle fibers and the repair mechanism that goes on. The, the immune system is involved in that. And that creates some pain. And that's a longer term pain than the lactic acid that's there. Lactic acid is, is quickly uh, removed from the muscle fibers by the blood sent to the liver and metabolized there. 
And there's a whole other process that goes on there with what's called gluconeogenesis um, that we're not discussing here. But the lactic acid does create some temporary fatigue and soreness, but certainly that's not the main contributor to muscle soreness after a hard workout. That's due to, like I said, microtrauma, tiny little tears to muscle fibers, and these tiny little tears will strengthen the muscle fibers and will increase strength and endurance in the, in the long term. This is just a, a, a common lab that's done in micro where you introduce bacteria into this liquid medium. Uh, it's called lactose broth, so it's just nutrient broth that has nutrients in it and the addition of the disaccharide lactose. Put in certain species of bacteria and they'll start producing lactic acid. They will lower the pH and as a result the red liquid turns yellow uh, as a result of the drop in the pH. There's a pH indicator in the test tube called phenol red and when the pH decreases the phenol red then turns yellow and that indicates to you that acid has been produced and the pH has dropped. Photosynthesis. So there are some bacteria that carry out photosynthesis so I just want to quickly cover this process. There's, it's a very complex process and I'm not going to do it justice at all but I'll touch upon some of the highlights of it. Get it? Highlights? light photosynthesis. <laughs> so photo uh, is the light part of it. It's the conversion of light energy into chemical energy. And that chemical energy is in the form of ATP and that occurs in the light dependent reactions. And then the synthesis part of it, what is being made, it's carbohydrates. It's mainly glucose. So fixing the carbon into organic molecules like glucose and we call those the light independent reactions or the Calvin Benson cycle. So there are two parts to photosynthesis. There's the light capturing part, which is converting the light energy into chemical energy in the form of ATP. And then there's the light independent reactions where the, the energy in the ATP is then transferred from it to glucose. And then the glucose is used for all sorts of processes in the plant, or in this case, the bacteria. So there's oxygenic photosynthetic uh, photosynthesis, sorry, um, where oxygen is a waste product. So you can see they take in carbon dioxide and water and light energy, and then that will yield glucose, oxygen, and water will be given off in this process. The glucose is what the plant is after. The oxygen, nearly all of it is gone. It goes into the atmosphere. Some of it remains to carry out the process of Krebs cycle and electron transport chain. Um, and then the water is also recycled as well. The oxygen that's given off comes directly from the splitting of water on the reactant side. So there's 12 molecules of water. Uh, when they're split, the oxygen is given off and released from the cell. And that's the oxygen that we are currently breathing right now. There is an anoxygenic photosynthesis in which oxygen is not given off. And you'll notice the equations look very similar, except in, in the place of H2O, we have H2S, hydrogen sulfide. So these are purple and green sulfur bacteria. So they're using sulfur as their electron acceptor in this process. And then you'll notice they're producing glucose as well because you've got to have glucose in order to get glycolysis and uh, to then move on to fermentation or the Krebs cycle. And then water and sulfur are given off. So there are, of course, plants and algae carry this out, but there are bacteria that carry out photosynthetic processes as well. So, very quickly, um, this is <laughs> what, graphically what photosynthesis looks like. <clears throat> if we want to be technical, we could call this photophosphorylation because that's really what the light-dependent reactions are all about. That's what we're looking at here, where light is absorbed by these green blobs that are called photosystems. Those photosystems will absorb different wavelengths of light or different colors of light, we could say. Uh, and then the energy from the light is transferred into electrons. Those electrons that are now energized, the energy from those electrons will be used for the same, in the same way that they were used in the electron transport chain in uh, respiration. So there are H plus ions that need to move from one side of a membrane to the other side of the membrane. So in this picture here, the colored part, that's a membrane inside the chloroplast. It's called the thylakoid membrane. And running through that membrane is an ETC. There's, there are actually two electron transport chains 
in the light dependent reactions or the light reactions. And so these energized electrons, the energy from them will be used to actively transport H plus ions to the top of the picture, to the top of the membrane. H plus ions will accumulate and accumulate on one side of the membrane and then that proton motive force will, will occur again. That will all take place. It will form and then this colored picture, which is so nice, didn't have the last step and so I had to get this generic black and white one here. Step six. Those H plus ions will be trying to create equilibrium, but they can't get through the phospholipid bilayer because of the lipids till eventually they reach the enzyme ATP synthase. Hydrogen ions will go through the synthase. The synthase will turn and convert ADP into ATP. It's very similar to the last electron transport chain that we looked at that takes place in mitochondria or the cell membrane of bacteria. Um, but of course there are pigments and there's light involved, but the overall goal is is pretty much the same. I mean, the end product needs to be ATP. That's what all cells are after. But what's cool about plants and cyanobacteria and algae and, and purple and green sulfur bacteria is that um, they use chemical, in the, form, in the case of the sulfur bacteria, they use chemical compounds or they use light energy. And they can convert that, those energy forms into something else, into chemical energy. It's amazing how this happens. And then, because they're producing their own energy, they can then use it for all of their cell processes. So, of course, plants and algae and bacteria that photosynthesize, they don't need to eat anything. They don't need to consume anything. They just need some minerals from the ground and, of course, water to replenish um, the H plus ions that are necessary to make the ATP. Then there's the Calvin-Benson cycle. So <clears throat> after the ATP is generated in the light, the light dependent reactions, we move on to the light independent reactions or the Calvin-Benson cycle. Here's where the carbon dioxide is utilized. So they're taking the carbon dioxide that all the other organisms on earth are breathing out like you and me and many others, billions of others, breathing out this carbon dioxide. It goes into the atmosphere and then the plants take it in or the algae or the bacteria. And so this carbon dioxide becomes the carbon source in order to make their glucose. So the carbon dioxide moves down through. Now the oxygen that's in carbon dioxide is actually utilized in the process. The oxygen from the water, that got split the water molecule that is, was split in the light dependent reactions. And when the water molecule splits, the oxygen leaves the cell and the H plus ions are then utilized. Well here they're taking in the other reactant, carbon dioxide, and using that to build up glucose. That's where these, these carbons are being placed in order to build up C6H12O6. And you'll notice the ATP that was produced in the light reactions, that ATP is being utilized in the Calvin-Benson cycle. You can see it in the two places there where ATP is converted into ADP at two different places there. And even this diagram is simplified as well just to give you an idea of what's going on. The NADPH which is carrying energized electrons, that NADPH was produced in the light dependent reactions is not the energy from that compound from those electrons that energy is also being utilized in this process as well. So NADPH becomes oxidized, gives up its energized electrons, and that energy then is deposited into these organic compounds which will eventually become glucose. And this is a cool link to a video, Where Do Plants Get Their Mass? It's by um, oh, a guy that starts with a V, Vera. Oh, I can't remember what his name is. Sorry, I should have looked at that. But anyway, he goes around and asks people, well, what are plants made of? And nobody seems to know. He gets kind of funny answers from people. They're kind of ignorant about how do plants, where do they come from? How do they get to be so big and massive? Um, he just walks up and interviews people. So it's an interesting video. My students can click on that link. So what is the metabolic diversity? Well, there's four categories, and then they can be divided even further. But there are phototrophs, which use light for energy, and chemotrophs, which are using chemicals for energy. There are autotrophs, which are using carbon dioxide for carbon source. And there are heterotrophs, which are using organic carbon for carbon source. So we can combine these, and we can say a photoautotroph, where they are using light to feed themselves. So trough comes from a Greek word that means food or to feed. Auto means self, photo means light. So using light to feed yourself.
a chemoautotroph is using chemicals to feed themselves basically so you can take a you can take the photo prefix or the chemo prefix and put them in front of autotroph then there are heterotrophs chemo heterotrophs that's what you and I are we are using chemical compounds for our energy to and we're it's coming from another source we cannot produce it ourselves so we have to get it from outside of our bodies get that energy into our bodies and then we carry out respiration and fermentation to extract the energy from the foods that we consume and this is what I was just explaining sorry I should have gone to the next slide um, but here's where you can see the combination of these photoautotrophs photoheterotrophs and so on just a, a chart that, that breaks down that metabolic diversity. Well, that's it. That's the end of part three of this three-part series on uh, metabolism. Uh, so much to cover, and uh, I, I, didn't, I feel I didn't do it justice. Um, there's so much more you could say, but again, this is introductory level. So I hope you enjoyed this lecture series and that it was of educational benefit to you. And um, stay tuned for the next chapter. I'll be covering... Um, uh, it'll be uh, for my college students it'll be chapter uh, six on uh, looking more in depth at bacteria and microbes and uh, how to control their growth so again thank you all for watching and uh, have a great day